Good afternoon and welcome to this year's uh, baccalaureate service at Dartmouth College as we celebrate the members of the class of 2013. Just a little background on baccalaureate services. Uh, it seems uh, to have originated in the early 15th century at Oxford University in England. Each graduate was obliged to deliver an oration or sermon in Latin to demonstrate his, and it was his, worthiness to receive the degree of bachelor, signified by crowning with a laurel. So all of you graduates, you're off the hook. You don't have to give a sermon, let alone in Latin today. This service was, in fact, what we now call commencement, for after you had orated and been crowned with laurels, you were a bachelor. You had your degree. In America, at religious colleges like Dartmouth was at its founding and early years, the graduation ceremony included a church service so that new graduates would understand both the seriousness of their new responsibilities and the true source of all their achievements. Today's service has evolved greatly since the days of Eliezer Wheelock. It's now an interfaith, intercultural service. But this is not a watered down service which in attempting to please all ends up serving none. At least I truly hope it will not be. Instead we celebrate the variety of religious and spiritual traditions that are now presented, represented at Dartmouth. As such, we do not expect everyone to be able to understand or affirm every aspect of this service today. Many parts may be familiar, some will not. We do hope that by honoring the integrity of various religious traditions, each participant will find both comfort and challenge. Not all religious traditions represented at Dartmouth are included in today's service simply because of the length that such a service would entail. Still, it is our goal over time to ensure that all the religious communities at Dartmouth are invited to bring their contributions to this time of celebration and worship when we pause as a college to give thanks to God for our graduates. Congratulations and God bless all of you who are graduating and to your families and friends who have supported you. Thank you. We celebrate with you and we pray that you may be a blessing in this world. I read that from my iPhone, so this is a reminder to please turn off your cell phones so that we do not disturb the worship service and then feel all embarrassed and all of that. Also, it being a worship service, I invite you to refrain from uh, taking photography and please, in any case, do not use flash photography. Let us be present to this moment. Let us not have anything in between this moment and us and let us be open to how this moment might be a time of celebration and blessing. And so for those who are able, I invite you to stand and sing our opening hymn, God of Ages, who with sure command.
I ask you to please remain standing for the duration of the prayer. The first is a prayer seeking God's light through the Muslim tradition. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma ja'al fi qulubina nooran wa fi alsinatina nooran wa fi sam'ina nooran wa fi absarina nooran wa min fawqina nooran wa min tahtina nooran wa an yaminina nooran wa an shimalina nooran wa min amamina nooran wa min khalfina nooran wa ja'alna nooran wa ja'alna nooran Lord God, we ask us, we ask you to give us light in our hearts and light in our tongues. Give us light in our eyes and light in our hearing. Give us light upon our right side, upon our left side. Give us light above us, light beneath us, light before us, and light behind us. Give us light, make us light. Lord God, we come to you today filled with emotions. We are excited, anxious, tired, and relieved with the conclusion of this journey. For all of us, this moment together is both an end and a beginning and requires us to pause and turn our multitask attention to you, to praise you for being God of both beginnings and endings. Thank you, Lord, for being with us individually as we have endured difficulties. Thank you for walking with us collectively as our community struggles with challenges and grieves the loss of companions. Thank you for orchestrating the relationships that define who we are, for bringing others into our lives that introduced us to ourselves and to you. Thank you for your patience with us as we frequently turned our awareness away from you, consumed by the whirlwind of obligations. This afternoon, I pray especially for the graduates as they stand on the brink of a new life. Lord God, allow them to appreciate the moment, to celebrate the things they have achieved, and to finish well. Fill them with courage, compassion, and creativity. Bless them to become the men and the women they dreamed they might be. Bless them to give the best of themselves to those they love and those that are in need. And bless them as they engage and seek to transform this world. Amen. Please be seated and any... Um Anyone who needs to come in is allowed to do so at this time. Thank you, Reverend Vogel and Dean Crocker. Greetings to distinguished, parent, distinguished guests, parents, relative friends, um, and all the guests here in the room. When our daughter Ariel, casually mentioned one night that my wife Eileen and I would be asked by Dean Crocker to speak at Baccalaureate, a couple of thoughts immediately came to mind. The first was the question, what is a Baccalaureate service? I now know that this is a Baccalaureate service. And I was greatly relieved to learn that speakers are no longer required to deliver their remarks in Latin. More importantly, I immediately came to realize how integral the Tucker Foundation and the Multi-Faith Council has been to Ariel's life at Dartmouth. I sense that Ariel's dedication to Tucker and the Multi-Faith Council, while rooted in the religious and spiritual, is also the result of discovering a deep connection to a very important group of people. <clears throat> Dean Crocker asked us to speak about what our daughter's Dartmouth experience and graduation mean to Eileen and me. Oddly enough, it's a topic to which we had given very little thought. As parents, we tend to obsess over our children and their experiences and rarely pause to reflect on how these experiences actually affect us. I have decided to continue that tradition and talk about more about Ariel's college experience, what we believe she has gained from it, and relate all that to what Eileen and I as parents had hoped she would experience during her time here at Dartmouth. It is often said that the toughest part of graduating from an institution like Dartmouth is actually being admitted in the first place. Certainly, 
the graduates and parents in the audience today know how intensely competitive it is to be admitted. Surely there must be a reward for being chosen. In my mind, that reward is a set of choices on how best to spend those very important four years. These choices can be as complex as defining one's set of values and sense of self, or as simple as choosing between a class in economics or biology, and include a spectrum of literally thousands of choices in between. So what were we as parents concerned about as Ariel began her college career? We had no doubt that she would work diligently and achieve academically, that she would live independently and manage her affairs, that she would be a loyal and empathic friend to many, that she would travel and explore, that she would give of herself to the community in the form of service to others, and that she would continue a life of persistent curiosity. Of all that, we were very sure. We were not so confident, however, that she would take the time and develop the perspective to actually enjoy Dartmouth. Or as Ben Hogan once said, take the time to smell the flowers. Believing that this would be the central issue for Ariel's four years in Hanover, Eileen and I pledged to keep a watchful eye. I even decided to take the risk of passing on a little advice as she began her college career. A buddy of mine, George Jensen, was the self-appointed entertainment coordinator of my own small circle of college friends. George never lacked for ideas when it came to diversions from the rigors of academia. Often, at the appropriate moment, George would invoke the memorable and convincing line, remember guys, we are not in college for a long time, we are in college for a good time. And so Eileen and I sent Ariel off to college with George's words as a reminder to smell the roses. I strongly suspected that Ariel's idea of a good time would not be quite the same as mine. And I'm greatly relieved my suspicions have been confirmed. I'm also happy to report that Ariel has indeed had a pretty good time here at Dartmouth. As proof, I would like to offer a composite of a typical Dartmouth day in the life of our daughter. This account is recreated from snippets of phone calls, emails, and texts, all of which I am pretty sure were transmitted to or from one of these events. Attending a UGA meeting, leading a multi-faith council panel discussion, lunch with Sarah at Yama, presiding over a study break for dorm advisees, of course, with snacks, organizing a J Street U program with Asher, attending Rosemary's violin recital, cooking for a large group with Claire, supporting Eli at her thesis presentation, dining with Ish and a host of others, organizing birthday parties with Valentina, listening to Ashley's a cappella performance, watching a movie with Bonnie, attending John's Glee Club performance, taking in a hockey game with Amanda, quickly checking in with Santa by text, and finally, playing squash with Vipple. It's pretty clear from this event collage that the common thread in Ariel's daily life is a near constant interaction with people. She chose to use her college years to meet people, find commonality, and create strong relationships. It is through these relationships that she has most enjoyed her college experience. It is through these relationships and many more to come that she will build her future. Eileen and I would like to thank Dartmouth College for providing this encouraging and inspiring environment. We are truly grateful for all Ariel's friends and acquaintances. And finally, Ariel, we are so very, very proud of you.
I'm a graduating senior, and this is a passage from the book Life of Pi, which I found meaningful in my faith development. After the hellos and the good days, there was an awkward silence. The priest broke it when he said, with pride in his voice, Piscine is a good Christian boy. I hope to see him join our choir soon. My parents, the pundit and the imam, look surprised. You must be mistaken. He is a good Muslim boy. He comes without fail to prayer every Friday, and his knowledge of the Holy Quran is coming along nicely, said the Imam. My parents, the priest, and the pundit looked incredulous. The pundit spoke, you're both wrong. He is a good Hindu boy. I see him all the time at the temple coming for Dushan and performing puja. My parents, the Imam, and the priest looked astounded. There is no mistake, said the priest. I know this boy. He is Piscine Moliter Patel, and he is a Christian. I know him too, and I tell you he is a Muslim, asserted the Imam. Nonsense, cried the pandit. Piscine was born a Hindu, lives a Hindu, and will die a Hindu. The three wise men stared at each other, breathless and disbelieving. Father raised his hands. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please, he interjected. I would like to remind you that there is a freedom of practice in this country. Three apoplectic faces turned to him. Yes, practice singular, the wise men screamed in unison. Three index fingers like punctuation marks jumped to attention the air, emphasizing their point. 
The pandit spoke first. Mr. Patel, Piscine's piety is admirable. In these troubled times, it is good to see a boy so keen on God. We all agree on that. The imam and the priest nodded. But he cannot be a Hindu, a Christian, and a Muslim. It is impossible. He must choose. I don't think it is a crime, but I suppose you are right, his father replied. And mother looked at me. A silence fell heavy on my shoulders. Hmm, Piscine. Mother nudged me. How do you feel about the question? Well, Babu Gandhi said, all religions are true. I just want to love God. I blurted it out and looked down red in the face. My embarrassment was contagious. No one said anything. It happened that we were not far at the time from the statue of Gandhi on the esplanade. Stick in hand, an impish smile on his lips, a twinkle in his eyes, the Mahatma walked. I fancy that he heard our conversation, but that he paid even greater attention to my heart. Father cleared his throat and said in a half voice, I suppose that is all we are trying to do, love God. I thought it very funny that he should say that. He who hadn't stepped foot in a temple with a serious intent since I had had the faculty of memory. But it seemed to do the trick. You cannot reprimand a boy for wanting to love God. These are the Buddha's words on loving kindness, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, translated from the Pali Canon. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways peaceful and calm and wise and skillful. Not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, the medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, is free from all suffering. A reading from the Gospel according to Luke from chapter 4 verses 16 to 21. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unscrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's now my privilege to introduce you to Bishop Gene Robinson, retired bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire, author, activist, humanitarian. Bishop Robinson, we are just so honored to have you here with us today. The tradition of the baccalaureate ser uh, service goes back to the 15th century, and the service gives us really a chance to pause and to give thanks for the opportunity that our graduating students have had to grow in the life of the mind and in character. And it gives us a chance to celebrate the opportunity they now have to go out and serve others in the communities in which they find themselves embedded. These students and all of us have a lot to learn from the example that Bishop Robinson has given us in his personal and professional life, from his dedication to mentorship, from his ability to resolve conflict and help others to learn to do so, from his steady and strong advocacy to improve the lives of all people, especially through anti-racism training, debt relief for impoverished nations, championing of civil rights, in HIV AIDS education. And we can learn from him, from his fortitude to carry out ministry in the face of controversy and turmoil. In his 2012 book, God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage, Bishop Robinson wrote this, quote, it seems to me then that vulnerability and self-disclosure at the heart of what we understand about the nature of God. When someone shares with you who they really, really are, it's a special offering. To do so when it risks rejection is a profound, holy gift. In words and actions, Bishop Robinson, you have remained true to your beliefs and values even when you had to take a risk to do so. We are inspired by your courage and commitment, and now my hope is that our graduates may find strength in your example and inspiration in your words. So please join me now in welcoming Bishop Gene Robinson. I am so glad to be here today and so honored, but I want to start by uh, praying uh, one of the greatest and shortest prayers uh, known to people of faith, and I want to pray it for the choir. Wow. <laughs> yeah? I also want you to take note of this moment because it may be more important than any word said or sung today. And that is people of all faiths are gathered under one roof in peace and in the words of Pi, just seeking to know and love God. The fact that we are gathered here, the fact that it happens so seldom, is something we should take note of and take home with us. Just the fact of our being here together is a statement that the world needs to hear. I just came back two days ago from Australia, and I learned to practice there that um, that I want to start in my own life. I'm gonna be a committee of one to change America about this. Um, if you've been in Australia, uh, and New Zealand does something similar, you know that at the beginning of every gathering, in the first two or three minutes, the speaker recalls to people's mind that they are standing on ground that was populated by the indigenous peoples of that land long before white people showed up and they pay their respects to those people. Standing here at Dartmouth, part of whose history is the education of indigenous peoples in this land, 
it seems to me appropriate that we remember that there were stewards of this land long before Europeans arrived. And to remember the Abenaki tribe of indigenous Americans and to pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I'll speak to you today from my own Judeo-Christian tradition, knowing that you are grown-ups and you can translate in your own minds uh, into your own traditions and stories. I think we do best always to speak out of the tradition that is ours and let others make those kinds of, of translations. And the story I want to focus on, um, part of which was uh, read so nicely uh, from the Gospel of Luke, um, is about Jesus in his early public life. And I, I think this says something to those of you who are graduating, and it's to you I want to address these remarks. I don't mind if the rest of you listen in, but I'm really talking to the graduates here. Early in Jesus' public ministry, he comes to the River Jordan to be baptized by John. And the story goes that a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. I mean, you can't get a much better affirmation than that, right? I mean, you get a big voice from heaven, and it says, you're my son. I'm totally wild about you. The next thing that happens in this story is, according to scripture, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. It actually says to be tempted by the devil. And what follows is a story of a conversation between the devil and Jesus, which I don't actually think was the devil at all. This was a conversation taking place in Jesus' heart. Jesus has withdrawn after this astounding affirmation to ask himself the question, what will I do with this knowledge? that I'm beloved of God. And what will I do with the gifts that have been given me? And so he's wrestling with himself. And um, the first temptation is uh, the devil says, oh, change these uh, stones into bread. Jesus thinks about sort of going the magic trick route with his ministry and thinks that's probably not the most fruitful use of his gifts. The devil suggests that um, he uh, perch himself on the parapet of the temple and throw himself off and let the angels swoop down and gather him up. Sort of the Cirque du Soleil approach to ministry, right? And while it would be quite spectacular, Jesus thinks, no, I don't, not, no, that's not for me either. And then the devil character says, oh, I know. You are so smart. You are so good with words. People like you. You are such a good leader. You know, you could take over the world. And this one is really seductive because you can almost hear Jesus saying to himself, you know, I would be the exception to the rule that power corrupts. I could do it right. I could gather all the power in the world and think of the good I could do. And ultimately, he says no. And scripture says, and the devil departs for a time, meaning Jesus dealt with those temptations the rest of his life. But we don't know what he chose until he comes out of the wilderness and into the setting that we just heard in, in Luke's gospel. He's back in his hometown of Nazareth. He's uh, invited um, to read in his local hometown synagogue. And he opens up the scroll from the prophet Isaiah and reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has called me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, to give sight to the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
And, and the people in the synagogue, we're told, uh, were kind of nudging each other, saying, ooh, he's, he's really good at this. this is, I mean, that's Mary and Joe's boy, right? Uh, he's, he's really making something of himself. And then, um, I'm from the South, and in the South, this is when they say the, the, uh, the minister goes from preaching to meddling, right? This is, he goes on to say, but yeah, lest you think that God's favor is just on us, the Jews. Let me just remind you that God's favor is on everybody. And then he names a couple of Gentiles who were, were uh, chosen and blessed over uh, their uh, Jewish neighbors. And the people in the synagogue get furious and they seek to throw him off a cliff. When you preach a God of whatever faith, a God that is too merciful, too kind, too forgiving, too loving, too accepting, too inclusive, there will be hell to pay. And you will get into trouble, I promise you. You can preach a vengeful, hateful God, and nobody will mind one bit. But you talk about a God that is too loving and I promise you, you will get into trouble. In some sense, this was Jesus' inaugural speech. It's where he announced to the world what his life would be about and how he was going to use his gifts on behalf of the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, and then he lived that out for the next three years, reaching out to the people that society had rejected especially those who had been condemned by the religious people of his day. And he stayed in trouble all the time. Because the love of people always trumped the rules. And ultimately, it got the Romans to kill him. Those of you who are graduating, this is, this is a very full time, and I, I suspect it's even hard to listen, but let me, let me tell you what I think this story just might have to do with your life. Now, your parents, at this point, have hopes for you. Um, probably among them are getting a good paying job, making sure you have health care, and finding the love of your life, if you haven't already done so. Dartmouth is probably hoping that you'll make lots of money and give lots of it to Dartmouth. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you what I think God wants for you. And I think God wants both more than that and less. I think God wants you to find meaning and purpose in your life. And I think God wants you to get into some gospel trouble. You, like Jesus, have, are about to have a tremendously affirming event. Graduation is, is really uh, amazing, and it's, you know, it's great that you got into Dartmouth, and it's even greater that you're getting out of Dartmouth. <laughs> there is a lot to celebrate, and you have lots of people around you, family and friends, who are affirming you all over the place. And like Jesus, uh, I suspect that if you haven't already done so, you will very soon begin to wrestle in your own heart with what you're going to do with the gifts you've been given here and elsewhere. So you could go the uh, magic, pizzazzy, tricks uh, way of uh, doing your life to impress other people. You could probably make a lot of money at it, and, and then what? Or you could go the Cirque du Soleil route and uh, learn to do all kinds of, of um, daring do feats of uh, amazing activity. The problem with that is, is that every day people will expect you to do more and bigger stunts. 
And it's a real rat race because you can never please everybody. And some of you, because you are so gifted, because you are good with people, because you are leaders, you will be tempted to think you're the one person who can gain power and authority and control over others without being corrupted by it. It is the most seductive temptation of all. And probably you would wind up being isolated and lonely and ruthless. What God wants you to consider, I believe with my whole heart, is a life that cares about the marginalized and the poor and the vulnerable. I think God wants you to care deeply for the world and not to become cynical and jaded and isolated. I think God wants you to get into trouble. Take some risks for doing the right things in the world to make the world a better place. If you're going to err, be on the side of loving too much, not too little. Too inclusive, not exclusive. Be as extravagant with your love for one another as God is about God's extravagant love. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about doing charity work or writing a check every now and again, but much more than that. There's a, uh, there's a great uh, uh, phrase, a sentence that, that describes this. It goes something like this. It's not enough to pull drowning people out of a raging stream. You have to walk back upstream and see who's throwing them in in the first place. I'm talking about justice work. Charity work is good. We have to keep rescuing people. We have to care for them. But somebody has got to walk back upstream and question the system that throws them in the raging stream in the first place. It's this systemic injustice that expresses itself as racism and sexism and heterosexism and ableism and all those isms that work in the same ways to divide us into them and us. And God, I think, wants you and me to work at making this a world in which there is no more them and us, only us. And if you can't do that kind of work directly, you can vote for, you can give money to, and you can support the efforts of those who can do that work directly, but you've got to care about it. I think it's the only way to find lasting purpose and meaning for your life, no matter what you do after Dartmouth. So I want to leave you with three questions to ponder, not between now and graduation tomorrow, but the next day or the next day after that, or the next day after that. How will you use your gifts? What will your inaugural speech be? And will you be brave and courageous enough to work for justice and to get into some gospel trouble for the common good? As you celebrate your graduation tomorrow, and you should, my prayer for you is that you become a justice seeker a troublemaker, and a force for compassionate good. And that in the process, you will come to know the very heart of God. Amen.
Thank you, Bishop Robinson. At this time, I would like us to pause in memory of a missed member of the class of 2013, Crispin A. Scott, who lost his life in January 2012. Crispin grew up both in Japan and in the Seattle area and began his studies at Dartmouth in September 2009. A math major, he was also an enthusiastic rugby teammate and devoted member of Phi Delta Alpha fraternity. His friends remember him as charismatic, loyal, genuine, and intelligent. Though his life ended far too soon, his memory will live on at Dartmouth among those who knew and cared so deeply for him and by the fund established in his name by his family. In addition, I would like to pause and acknowledge the tragic loss this week of Ernest Amo, the brother of 2013 classmate Justice Amo, and a member of the extended Dartmouth family. Please join me in a moment of silence in honor of these two young men and all our loved ones who could not be with us this weekend. Thank you. Good afternoon. As we uh, come to sing our second and final selection, I just want to, uh, in the form and fashion of a West Point graduate, I'm used to and accustomed to giving orders. <laughs> One of the things that I'm gonna ask of you, graduating seniors, I've had the opportunity to come to get to know many of you. And I, thanks to the profound words of Bishop Robinson, I wanna dare you to go out there and make the world a better place. So often I've heard people say that, and you know, to take the words of Oprah Winfrey, people say, I, I want to be like her. And I've had some students come and say, Walt, I'd like to be just like you. And, and my challenge to you is, Walt's pretty much got down being himself. So I want to dare you to go out there and be you, do you. No one else can do that. God created you wonderfully unique for you to go out there and change the world only the way you can do. So go out there and make that world a better place. So as we sing this next song, it's in your programs that we're gonna sing how much we can bear. Well, the kids have told me they don't wanna sing that. So, <laughs> so we're gonna sing something different. Uh, what I want you to do is, can you all clap for me? Clap on beats, oh, no, 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 wait. <laughs> in gospel music, we clap on beats two and four, okay? So we're gonna practice. One, two, three, four, one. Very good. All right, so we're gonna test you. Are you ready to crank this music? Hello, over there on sound. Hello. Crank my mic. Here we're gonna do, we're gonna do this. Oh, 
We're going to talk about a brighter day. Would you all please stand? And I would ask that you remain standing after the benediction as the uh, procession leaves the chapel. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. O oh, may this bounteous God through all your lives be near you with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer you and keep you in his grace and guide you when perplexed and free you from all ills in this world and the next.